Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Hidden Pearls podcast. My name is Emma, and I am here with one of my <laughs> all-time favorite yoga teachers. And this has just been such a long time coming. Um, Kieran is my kundalini yoga teacher and has sweat that was like five or six years ago. We just right. figured it out. And since then, I feel like we talk at least weekly now on a regular basis. Right. Maybe you have a little grandbaby who's taking up a lot of your focus, but exactly. it's the best. It's the, it's the best. Yes. More strong women. So Kieran, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you. Nice to be here. Yes. Okay. So I just want to read your bio. I pulled this off of your website, but Kieran Kalsa, 500 E-R-Y-T is KRI certified in Kundalini Yoga and Light Harmonics certified in energy medicines. She co-founded Purest Potential, which is where mom and I studied. We're going to get into Jan as a Kundalini practitioner. A lifestyle company that, promote, that promotes awareness, courage, self-mastery, and sovereignty. She is the co-author of Numerology for Self-Mastery, Tantric Numerology, and Numerology for Brilliance. I need you to sign my books. <laughs> Will do. After moving from the Netherlands in 1975, she practiced and lived in ashrams across the Western United States. Today, Kieran and her husband and their little baby granddaughter <laughs> focus on their mission to create a spiritual movement which empowers people to find their own guidance, love, and freedom among Oh, freedom, again, from within themselves. Kieran is a longtime course creator, an inspiring online voice on conscious living, a leader of spiritual journeys, and a proud mother of two of the most amazing young adults in this world. One of them is sitting right next to us. And now a grandmother to our little Navani. So Kieran, yes. thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. It's fun. So, um, like I said, Kieran and I met like five or six years ago, and guided me through our first kundalini yoga teacher training and so how you live in santa fe give me a little rundown what's going on with life now how are you well it's been a very transformational decade i should say um we lived in the ashram about 30 miles north of santa fe and i always loved coming to santa fe and very grateful to be living there. It's just this most beautiful city, most beautiful environment. And um, we were running a health center in a yoga center, big L-shaped building, and have sold the building recently and now are moving our business online and just continuing doing the work that we love to do. Santa Fe is pretty special. Yeah, yeah, it is. So moving from the Netherlands, so how long, so you moved here in 1975. Um, how has that kind of been, I guess like how was the, I feel like it's hard for me to do podcasts sometimes where I know someone very well <laughs> because I forget all like the details that I already know in my head that we haven't totally talked about. So I guess paint a little picture of Kieran in 1975 moving from the Netherlands and <sighs> making her way to Santa Fe. So let's just say like how did you get to Santa Fe and then you know, kind of where we are now. Okay, so we were raised near Amsterdam towards the coast in a city called Haarlem. And I was there very young as a teenager during the whole hippie movement in Amsterdam. And Amsterdam was an epicenter for that. So I was kind of on the young side, but I was really related to the spirit of it because we had all these, you know, these hippies were flocking to Amsterdam, living in the Fondel Park and uh, music and the Beatles and all that was going on. So then <laughs> we moved from that culture, very liberal, uber liberal, you know, taking the train everywhere, riding my bike everywhere, wearing my Birkenstocks, and you know, just that's just life, very natural living. From there, I moved to Dallas, Texas, because my parents got divorced. She met my mother, met an American, and he, that's where he lived. So that was quite a shock for me at the time. The only person I could relate to was this guy in my French class who had long hair and a beard and wore Birkenstocks, of course. And he happened to be doing yoga. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he happened to be doing uh, Kundalini yoga. And I had been doing yoga with Lilius Yoga and You mm -hmm. on the TV because I could not speak English. I could not relate to the culture of America. I was very lonely very, very lonely, and just started kind of searching for uh, something that would bring me more uh, peace 
and, and just kind of a feeling of being okay. So I, I, this guy said, you want to come to yoga class with me? I said, sure. <laughs> so I came to my first Kundalini yoga class and I was slightly freaked out because these people were all dressed up in their turbans and their white clothes. And I was just like, I'm not joining any cult. I'm not doing this. I'm not turning into some religious anything. And uh, loved the yoga. Just the yoga, just I kept coming back for the yoga because it made me feel what I had been longing for, and I couldn't get from the other pra yoga practices that I'd been doing. Because Kundalini Yoga kind of incorporates, you know, yeah. the chanting, the breathing, the movement, the relaxation, the... Sound baths. Yeah, the sound. The, the sound. sound. And the singing. Oh, my God, I love that. And then there was always food. Yeah. At the end of class, we would all sit around <laughs> a big table and eat together. And that's like, to me, it was like, oh, my God, I don't have to go to a bar to be with people. I can just be here and be in like a family setting and that was important coming from Europe uh, that's what I missed in America that you know everybody's just lived in their little islands and nobody nobody had a place that they could really come come together so I kept doing the yoga you want me to go do the whole story sure. okay I love it <laughs> so then I met my husband was there, but he was like one of the big teachers. And at the center. At this at, in the Dallas Ashram. And at this time you're not wearing a turban. I'm not I'm just a full on hippie yeah. still. You know, okay. sure, trying to a Dutch speak, hippie. Doesn't a, really speak English. Not much, no. Okay. And how I, old were you at the time though? I was when I came to the States I was fifteen. So by now I'm sixteen, seventeen. Okay. And started connecting with who is now my husband. And my and then my parent, my mother and stepfather moved to Australia, and I didn't want to go with them because I was in my final year of high school. I didn't want to like, like get all behind with that. So I stayed behind, lived with the girlfriend and her family, and then um, got closer with my hus my now husband, because he was the one I talked to. He was the one I really uh, respected, and and I could have intelligent conversations with. <laughs> And like about consciousness and meditation and yoga, and that all intrigued me. So my mother came over when I was about to graduate from high school, and she said, so where are you going to live? I said, well, I'd really like to go live in the ashram because I want to explore this more. She goes, well, are you going to marry somebody there? I said, I don't know. <laughs> you know it's like that. I wasn't thinking that. I was just thinking I'd move yeah. in the ashram. And she goes, no, you're not. And then she told my father I was joining a cult. <laughs> he flew over from Holland. They tried to get me deported to Holland. It's a whole other big story. During this whole thing that happened, I ha I, it's like the universe conspired to have me face the fact that I was either going to be going back to Holland or marry my now husband. And like I said, I that was not my plan. I didn't hadn't planned on that at all, but it just came down to that. And I said, okay, this is the life that I want. I, it's probably the one really clear decision that I've made back in that time of my life and that this is what I chose to walk a spiritual path. I wanted to walk it with a partner who could meet me in that mm -hmm. and who would, uh, that both of us felt that that was the most important thing in our lives is to, to really have a life that contributes to the well-being of society, of the world, and could give tools for people to live a life that was um, not so confusing, not so yeah. painful. So, and then we lived in the Dallas Ashram, you know, we got married, we lived in the Dallas Ashram, then I wanted to move to New Mexico, but I didn't want to come to New Mexico, you know, with my husband being a carpenter or, you know, ha cleaning houses or something like that. So we realized that he loved healing, mm -hmm. and at that point, he was studying energy medicine, and I was wanting to become a chiropractor. So what actually happened is the table oh, started. I didn't know that. He became the chiropractor. We moved to Los Angeles, lived there, mm -hmm. really got involved with the whole uh, Sikh community there. That was a big movement in, in, Cal in uh, Los Angeles. That was mm -hmm. like a big center. And um, then I started studying energy medicine, just kind of on the side. Had a baby there. The baby passed away at 11 months. Then we completed all our, you know, that was very intense. Anybody out there who's gone through the death of a child, um, 
It's one of the hardest things I think a person can ever go through, and I honor you and want to respect you for for that path of learning, and it was hard. I, I went through a phase in my life that I literally couldn't feel anymore. I just thought that that was way too scary, and then did some healing there, but it didn't really happen until I came back to New Mexico. And then in New Mexico, we lived in the Espanol Asham, and had an amazing time there for many, many years. And then uh, that whole thing turned, and I think we're going to talk about that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and um, from the Espanola Asham, when that time was complete, and there was, you know, the community's intention really shifted, we moved to Santa Fe to continue mm -hmm. what's been important. I've been a hippie at heart all my life. <laughs> it's all about love and peace as far as I'm concerned, and um, that never changed. I yeah. might look different now, but my intention has always been to contribute to the well-being of, of all beings on this planet. So, I love in that. a nutshell. In a nutshell. <laughs> okay, before we go too far away from this, I just want to, yeah. like, I'm trying to imagine being 17 and... Like, I know Guru Chander now, Dr. Guru Chander, and you're just like, you want to get married? Like, how did that go down? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that went down in this way. I feel like you were just like, let's do it. <laughs> so he, so my parent, my parents, so now they're divorced, right? So my father comes over from Holland. My mother is there. It's like emotional for me to see them together because yeah. I haven't seen them together for a while. And my father says, I want you to come to Holland with me. And I'm just like, what is going on? Then Grichander set me down. I sat, I sat on his lap you know, without them there. And he said, OK, you're either going to listen to your father or you're going to be with me. So you need to make a decision right now. Who are you going to be with? And I'm just like, oh, God. <laughs> This is so not romantic. This is not what I imagined. No ring, no nothing. Just come here, Kira. <laughs> You're right. Just sit on my lap. Listen to me. No. <laughs> so then I, uh, that, that, and then the whole thing happened that they tried to take him to court with a writ of habeas corpus, mm. which is a custody thing. And I was almost 18, so the judge basically said, you know, I'm, this, I'm dismissing this case yeah. because all you're saying is how smart she is and how she's a grade a, you know, grade a student in high school. And so, but that whole thing was very difficult. And then I didn't see my parents or my mother until my, after my son had passed. Wow. So it was a very, very difficult time. She was there a little bit, but it was hard for her. And I'm sure, you know, I wasn't the greatest communicator and I just back then and you know I've learned a lot and healed a lot but that was a very difficult time and I think I kind of withdrew into my practice and into you know when you wear special clothes like we did back then the white clothes and the turbans and all that it um it kind of provides an isolation which was helpful for me at that time but then you know that also there's two sides to everything. So that yeah. I, I also used it to stay away from the world. Yeah. Like, you know, I remember being very little in Italy and looking up at a monastery going, wow, I wonder what that's like. You know, there's the, the, for, you, for, your, for you to just be living a life that you're just you and the sacred, you and God. And then, but the, my path was not the Christian path, so I couldn't, you know, I just couldn't relate to the whole male thing. And you know, so I was just like, I was so confused. <laughs> it's like, what is it? What is this God thing? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So paint a picture for me of Kundalini in the 70s and like what oh was my going God, on. Oh my God, so in, much fun. I believe that. Because I, I want to transition into, because like we talk a lot about Kundalini, but I think you, especially being my teacher, you know, kind of hearing it from you and explaining that, but I'd love for you to like paint the picture of it and like, what was it, like what was so amazing about it? So for me, cause like, I just don't think, like when I think of Dallas, Texas, I'm not like right. mecca center of spirituality and like right. divine feminine raising your consciousness, like, and nothing against Dallas. Like I love going to Dallas, but I don't go to Dallas for spirituality. Yeah, no, right. I go for 
right. boots and yeah. horses. <laughs> shopping. I do, I do, I like that, you know. It's great shopping. But, it's, but the land is really sacred in Texas, but yeah, it's just, I wouldn't, right. I wouldn't pinpoint that. So I think it was a trick from the universe because there really wasn't <laughs> anything else for me. I couldn't relate to the people in high school. I could, didn't like all the shopping. I thought driving was so scary, you yeah. know, for coming from Europe to those big, you know, the, the biggest uh, roads ever, biggest roads ever. And biggest everything in ever. Texas is huge. Yeah. So the only <laughs> place that I really had fun and enjoyed myself was at the ashram, uh, was a bunch of young people living together loved making food, they all shared everything. Like you put something in the fridge in the morning and you never knew if it was gonna be there when you came home at night. <laughs> and it was all okay, it was love and peace back then. We would go to the Hare Krishna temple to dance with them because they had the best mm -hmm. dessert. <laughs> and you know, it was just like, so we had found, we kind of found our, our, our people, yeah. our community within the bigger center of Dallas. And Dallas was not as big then. Yeah as it is now, it's yeah. huge now. So it was really where I went as much after school as I could, where I spent my weekends, and just more and more was recognizing that I loved the spirit of it. I, and the, the teachers would, you know, we'd all just sit on the ground and do the yoga together. And the, <laughs> I remember at one point the teacher laid down to have us all go in Shavasana. And we all went into Shavasana, and the teacher was sound asleep. You know, everybody's up like 30 minutes later going, I think class is probably over. What do you think? You know, and then we just all kind of walk out. But it was not this whole big, it was more love about love and the heart center than, you know, getting a degree or, or becoming, you know, yeah. making it your business. It, it wasn't about making money back then. It wasn't about being the best that kundalini yoga somehow was better than other kinds of yoga. It was just all of us trying to find a way to be in relationship to life that made more sense, that was more kind, that was more inclusive, and not so polarizing. Yeah. So that was really the spirit back then. Was It was really, really fun. And we would do these things in Texas that all the ashrams, and there were big ashrams, and Houston had a big one, Dallas had not such a big one. But we would all get together at one of the ashrams, like every three months, and just spend an entire weekend doing yoga. And we would do it until we'd pass out. <laughs> that was like, exactly what I'm picturing. <laughs> right? That was like the thing. We would just get completely stoned on yoga. And, you know, all live together. And we would all clean the toilets together and, you know, clean the, the spaces and cook together. And, and it was just about being in community. And we'd just come out of that whole Vietnam War. And it was just a time that I think the psyche of the young people really needed healing. It needed more, a more intense purpose yeah. of for why are we here? What are we doing? You know, how can we just send people off to foreign countries to get killed? And, you know, what are we here for? What kind of community do we really want? And, you know, uh, it showed me that if you want to make a change, we got to do that. You know, it's got to start at the bottom with all of us. So that's what we were attempting to do. And we did, we had a great, <laughs> we had fun. <laughs> that's the best part. Yeah, I know, uh -huh. it was, it was. So then explain, I guess, let's go into like what Kundalini Yoga is and how it, I mean, I have a bunch of different questions, like what is it? I mean, yeah, just let's start with like, what is Kundalini Yoga? So Kundalini, you know, all yoga has to do with the Kundalini. Mm -hmm. So Kundalini Yoga was brought to the United States by Yogi Bhajan, who was trained by a Kundalini master in India. And then he, he brought in elements of the Sikh religion because he was a Sikh. And every yoga has a, has a lineage that it, that it pays tribute to. It just because there, because yoga is fundamentally about the, mar marrying the sacred and the and the worldly. It's that's the purpose of yoga is to bring those two yoke to yoke those two together. Hatha is the sun and the moon, so it's bringing the the balance of the two together. So Kundalini yoga is called the yoga of awareness, 
It is a practice to allow you to tune into you. Yeah. It's to allow you to become, see, I, we are born with a, a, an energetic blueprint. Okay, that's like your cleanest, the, the, the baby like Navani just now that we saw, she, her energetic blueprint is her core self. She's completely true to herself right now. Mm -hmm. And then as we live our lives, you get imprints, you get society, you get hurts and pains and events happen that start shifting our energetic frequency mainly in the chakra system. So what Kundalini Yoga does is through very specific practices, you raise your awareness from being reactionary to life or, you know, something happens and you, you, you react. Something happens and you react the same way that you did, the, the, you know, the 4,000 times before. In Kundalini Yoga, through the practice of becoming aware of your subtle space, your subtle bodies, you can, you get to respond rather than react to your life. Your awareness literally starts moving through this energetic channel up the spine to the higher centers where you can live from the third eye, which is on our dollar bill, the all seeing eye. And if you start to navigate your life from a place of vision and intention versus reactivity, which is down in these chakras, these bodies, um, the Kundalini journey is to allow you to drive your bus. You know, that you, you tell whoever has been driving your bus to please scoot over and you're now sitting at the steering wheel. You know where you're going and you're going to take your vehicle, your body, your mind, your spirit, to a very intentional destination. And mm -hmm. Kundalini Yoga, the beauty of it is, as a woman, that Carl Jung said that there's two ways to express your life. It's the hero's journey or the mother's journey. The hero's journey is all about going out, conquering your dragons, and, you know, it's, it's very outward movement. The mother's journey is completely going within and going down. Now, the kundalini energy resides behind the third chakra. It doesn't just go up. The, the practice, when you, <laughs> when you put... Uh, pressure on these energetic centers, the Kundalini actually goes from the third down to the first chakra. So you go down into the cellar first. You have to descend into your shadow part. You have to descend into all the places where you've chosen to become unconscious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we take a little flashlight into that cellar to see what's really there. You know, what, what has been in there that you haven't had the skills or the awareness to be with. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much a process of, you know, rising above or all that. It's a process of integration. It's a process of, of going down into the, into the darkness, into that first chakra, and then allowing that energy to raise in a way that it integrates at every center the positive and the negative, the ha and the tha, you know, it's, 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 it's the path of yoga, is that integration. And as Kundalini yogis, we experience that the heart is the portal to the expression of every single body in its most pure potential form. So, <laughs> and hence, is, that's the name of our business. <laughs> Purest potential. Pure is that which has not been... Mm. impregnated from the outside. Potential is the kundalini. So potential has also been called the quantum field. Mm -hmm. um, it is, you know, out of, outside of our reactivities. And, you know, I've been doing this for, like, what, 47 years? I'm still in the cellar. I'm still using my flashlight going, are you kidding me? <laughs> this again? <laughs> are you back again? <laughs> you know, this is like, this just never ends. As long as you have breath in your body, there's opportunity to heal. There's an opportunity to integrate. There's an opportunity to become more authentic. And the beauty of this practice for me is that it is never done. Yeah. 
You know, it's never, I'm never at a place that I say, oh, wow, I've seen it all, I've done it all, because the next meditation could take me so much deeper. Yeah. And it's just, you know, it just keeps me coming back. And so I had a student once, and he said, I love this practice. It's like it's, I have my martial arts and my yoga and my swimming and my chanting and my dancing all in the same class. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it is. And we have a friend who had a studio in Florida, and she had, like, the Hatha yogis would be on this side, and the Kundalini yogis would be here. And in Hatha yoga, it was all quiet, and, you know, that's all the stretchy up the wall and all the things. And then in the Kundalini side, they were dancing yeah. and <laughs> chanting and gonging, you know, and, and singing Stomping. with instruments. And, and, yeah. and it's like everybody from the Hatha class was like, Hmm, I wonder what's over there. So for me, it was a, an integration. Kundalini yoga just integrates the aspects that I like, which mm -hmm. is chanting. I love community. We always serve yogi tea at the end of mm -hmm. every class, so we sit around and talk. So it, you're not just going to class to, you know, get in good shape and then you leave. It's like a whole community-making event. And, you know, Healthy, Happy, Holy was the organization that we named it, that Yogi Bhajan named it. Okay. Driving your bus. That's what, right? So, so there's different models for reality. The Newtonian model is very deterministic. It's like, it's like the, you know, we used to say oh, the law of karma is when you take a ball and you throw it against the wall, it comes back at you. So in the Newtonian way that we've all been raised, and that was like, that's the main, well, for back when, when I was growing up, um, that if you do certain things, if your genes are, have a certain expression, then you were determined to express cancer, or you were determined to always be angry because your father was an angry person. And, and what Kundalini Yoga has given me is a, a way to self-determine my life mm -hmm. and to recognize that it really, that instead of the outside influencing the inside, my inside influences the outside. Mm -hmm. So if I can shift my inner environment, then the outer environment starts reflecting that. And it's so much more empowering for me to live that way mm -hmm. than to think I'm a victim of of events and circumstances of my genetic, you know, my genetic whatever you say, call it, yeah. composition. Uh -huh. um, and that through lifestyle, through really training my mind to be disciplined about giving energy and giving my emotions to the things that I actually want to express yeah. rather than react to the things that upset me. And this I really had to learn with the transition that we went through in the Kundalini community. Right. Yeah. And I think you've shared some stuff about just like being Dutch and like some conditioning on how you were raised and even like even stuff with your mom. But like has there been, like, was there a, do you feel like there's a difference with, like, the stuff that you process versus, like, Mita, you know, and, like, how oh. she's been kind of, like, I mean, because she's always been raised in right. spirituality. Right. Yeah. I think the only reason my parents had me go to Sunday schools that so they could have some time off. <laughs> so spirituality was not, there was religion and right. there was, you know, that was all there. But I knew that there was a whole element that was missing and it made me feel so insecure to not have that spiritual component in my life. Right. As a teenager, I remember just kind of like, you know, wondering what is this all about? Yeah. And seeing my children and how they've grown up, to this day, they had, they're anchored in their spirit. They're anchored in their connection to their breath. They're, they're anchored in places that I had to really, really right. look for. <laughs> Hello, train. Come on, train. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I think what I've seen is that the capacity for my children to handle stress is so much greater than yeah. what it was for me. I just didn't have the nervous system. I didn't have the tools. I didn't have the connections to my breath and my body and to recognize that this is an instrument of consciousness. Mm -hmm. You know, if I treat it like my temple, it'll give me that environment of a temple. If yeah. I treat it and by putting junk in it, then I get that result. And that's my choice. Yeah. But it's deeper than that, you know, because... <laughs> 
we can know all the right things, mm -hmm. but if we don't have the, the technology to shift our energetic makeup, we're always going to be repeating those patterns because they're so powerful. Mm -hmm. And when you say technology, like, because we always talk about Kundalini as a technology, right. right? And like, whether it's called a tool or like something on your tool belt, you guys have always referred to it as technology. Yes. And that was the first time I'd ever heard your yoga being called technology. Right. right. It literally is a practice that will ch that changes your energetic frequency. Yeah. And the the challenge with kun with the Kundalini practice that is that if you do that raising of the Kundalini too fast your nervous system can blow out. Yeah. And we've seen that with people that have taken hallucinogenic drugs um, for, you know, for beautiful, innocent reasons. But it's when the Kundalini energy rises, it literally increases your voltage. Yeah. And because if that energy goes all the way up the spine to the higher center, the energy here expresses much more, it's a more subtle energy. And you know, the at atomic energy is way more powerful than whatever you and me talking energy. So it, when that really subtle energy starts expressing and your nervous system is literally not conditioned to handle that, you can have what looks like uh, it could look like to people a, a nervous breakdown yeah. or, uh, you know, like all of a sudden you have energy rising and you're shaking. When you do a Kundalini practice and you start shaking and, and all that, it tells you your nervous system's not ready yet. Right. So just back it, back it down, yeah. you know, go slow again, get your body, make sure you're eating the right food. So the technologies that your whole life becomes about how can I host this energy in the mm -hmm. most conscious way? Mm -hmm. Because this is not like having a little Buddha statue in your house that you dust every now and then, you know? I mean, when you start awakening yeah. this, this vital force, it's your creative soul energy. When you start consciously calling on that, there is a whole protocol that comes along with that. You know, you don't just become a policeman by putting on the outfit. Right. You know, you got to learn how to hold yourself in a way that brings well, that, 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 that's in alignment with what, what it is that you're projecting. So if I put on all the white clothes and yet I'm living, you know, in, not in harmony with universal laws, which we call dharmic living, it's when you live dharmically, you live according to laws that are universal. You know, you do good to, for other people. Your life is in the contribution to, you, you help the earth be a, you know, cleaner, healthier place. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a whole thing. So the scary thing about Kundalini is that you just don't go to class once a week. You know, when you get into it, and I've seen people, when Kundalini yoga is your yoga, you will fall into it. You yeah. will just disappear into it. And all of a sudden, <laughs> yes, there we are. And that's what happened to her when I met you. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think when people first started, it's kind of like, whoa, they can feel that. Their soul is like, yay, yeah. you know, once, once more. And then your whole training is, you know, we're trained to, to, we're conditioned to stay the same, to do the same thing, because that's our familiar past. Right. And to step out of that into the unknown is scary. And I've seen women especially stay in abusive relationships because the pain of change and the unknown is greater than the abuse that they're going through. Right. And that just like, oh, that's so painful to me because I know every woman has the potential to grow beyond those limitations. Every, every man does. You know, we all, we're not born to repeat what's been done. We're not here to, you know, look to our past and repeat it. We, we are here to look at our past and learn from it, integrate it, turn it into wisdom, and then, you know, become greater, mm -hmm. be more of a contribution. And the world is completely different now than it yeah. was 50 years ago. So... Did that answer your question? It was amazing. <laughs> and like, well, and I guess, cause I think about when I first started, right? Like I did one class and I was in Montana on a, like with a bunch oh, of right. girls, with a bunch of women and Laurie taught us and it felt like I got slapped, not slapped, but it was just like, like this, it felt like my intuition finally had this clear channel to be like, Emma, 
this is what's going on in your life. Mm. And until then, I had been like, oh, I don't know. Do I feel that? Like, maybe. I don't know. You know, like, mm. not driving my bus. You know, or, like, thinking that I had so much stuff figured out. And then this practice, it just, like, I feel like it kind of cleared the channel of all the other noise. And, like you right. were saying before, like, the conditioning or the stories or, like, I'm not supposed to go through this or I'm not supposed to walk away from something that it finally shook me enough and it was so loud. And I was like, oh, duh. You know, like, obviously that's, that's what I want to live. And it, that's the way that I want to live. And I felt like it kind of gave me, it helped me to find my voice within that, like even to kind of organize my thoughts in my head so that I could then start orienting my life in that way. And like, when I first started practicing, like, thank God I have the coolest parents in the world, but they were, you know what I mean? Where I was like, I need to wake up at seven and I'm going to be doing this meditation every day. And then I'm going to go to this yoga training and mom, we got to drive to Santa Fe. And like, there were so many different pieces that were just like, my life is like, like, I need to go figure, I don't know what's going on, but I need to know more. Yeah. You know? And I think, yeah, like I got some kickback, you know, yeah. like everybody was kind of like too much. I don't know. Like maybe you shouldn't talk, like maybe you're like going too hard. And it was just like, it just felt like somebody, I turned the faucet on, right. on my awareness and I was starting to see how numb I had become in a lot of other areas. Mm -hmm. And then you, yeah. you can't really go back. I know. They, we say that's like the toothpaste, you know, you squeeze it out yeah. of the tube, you can't stuff you it, can't back stick in. it back in. It's not going back in. <laughs> it's not going back in. And it, it literally is that you turn the light on. It's like yeah, uh, a light's good. The, the light, we the went light, down. We went down, and then the light gets turned on, and you live with awareness, and you cannot show up anymore numb. Yeah. You cannot go do the shopping anymore, or the boozing, or the drinking, or the sexing, or the, you know, all the addictions that we keep that we use to keep ourselves numbed out yeah. to our own greatness. Yeah. You know, like the Nelson Mandela speech. It's not, it's not our darkness that we're afraid of, it's the light. Yeah. Because once you turn on your light, other people get offended, some, because it shines, it shines on them, and then they have to kind of step up and say, "Oh, I, you know." It reveals um, a lot of shadows. It does, and you know, and that's very uncomfortable. Yeah. But I believe that the 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 most intentional way to change this world is for every single person to become conscious of the amazing being that they are. Yeah. And that's how, and you know, we've been in cultures and societies and dogmas that have tried to make us be followers of what someone else's experience. And that somehow by living a certain way, according to what somebody else tells you, that that's, you know, it's kind of like we've been on a guided tour. It's like, if you, if you do all this, then that's such a good way to say it. <laughs> this is at the end, but it's, it's our own a adventure. Plus actually doesn't equal C. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's yeah. like, and I saw that in you when you were doing the practice and I could see you just go, Literally, like your light turned on, and I, and then you made some very big decisions in your life that you'd been waiting on, and when when you step into your courageous self from the one that you were before, it's hard to go back. Yeah, you know it really is, and yet I've I see that That's too. That's true. This is, but if you go to sleep on it, which some people do, it's like okay, I've done all my thousand day meditations, da da da, now I'm good. Yeah, you know. You're not. You would never go out without brushing your teeth. Yeah. You think your mind is any less uh, sensitive to impressions? Yeah. You know, so every morning we get up before the sun rises. We get up to clear that space so the stuff from yesterday isn't dictating what's happening today. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, never, it never stops. And yeah. thank God it doesn't because yeah. I like who I am when I can be myself. Mm -hmm. I don't like it when I'm reacting or when the past is dictating, mm -hmm. you know, how I sh should step up. Or if I'm listening to someone else's voice and let that be more, st more powerful than mine. Yeah. I don't like who I become then. I don't either. And I loved having your mom there. <laughs> Jan was so cute. She had no idea she was going to do this. And, and again, I, you know, from what I saw in her was the, just the family feeling that yeah. starts happening with Kundalini. And I, I could tell that was important to you. And I can tell for every single person that comes to a class to have authentic connection with other people, to have a conversation that's actually meaningful, it feeds your soul. It's like you yeah. leave and you're just like, whoa, 
whoa, you know, I'm inspired about life again. I can, I want to do this more. Yeah. <laughs> I want to be me. And I want to do the practice that allows me to be myself. And I have the energy to exactly. sustain it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then learn all the tools and, you know, the Kundalini. It's not just a class you come to. When you go through the training or any, any Kundalini yoga class, you typically get more mm. in input and more ideas about how to maintain that. Because it's one thing to raise your Kundalini. You can fall off the stairs on your butt Raise your kundalini. <laughs> it's easy. You do it accidentally. <laughs> you do you it. Can. You can. Yeah. You can take drugs and raise your kundalini. The hard way, the hard thing is, can you keep your life in such a way that the kundalini energy stays? You know, it, it raises up the back of the spine and then comes down the front. And that's a flow that you can keep going if you have the lifestyle to help that be so. You know, if you eat the right foods, if you think the right thoughts, if you allow yourself to not go down the deep, dark, you know, depression thing. Yeah. And it literally is training. And, you know, uh, there was a teacher once that, that uh, the students would come up and go, oh, I'm not feeling it. And he'd say, are you doing your practice? And they go, no, you don't understand. I'm too busy. I'm too... He goes, come back to me when you're doing your practice. I can't. There's nothing we can do. Yeah. You know, if you're not doing your practice, then... Me, 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 all that, <laughs> it'll just, that'll just be your story. And, and that's okay. Yeah. But if, you know, until that pain gets greater than the pain of change. Mm -hmm. Well, and so speaking of like the different technologies that we use, yogic numerology is a really big yeah. part of it. And it's a whole piece in how we kind of oriented Hidden Pearl Studio because I love it so much. Like I totally right. nerded out on it and just, I felt like it helped me so much, but I guess it, it also, like, the thing with yoga numerology that has been so awesome for me is, like, it helps you to see all these different parts of yourselves, right. right? Like, the first time I went down and I saw this side, and, like, in the second month, we're going to go down and see this, and in the third month, we're going to go down and focus on this, and I think it really made me, like, I didn't realize how much other stuff was still down there or like how, hmm. how much stuff was tied to it. And so I think for me, yogic numerology has been this like really cool guide in getting to know myself on an insanely deeper level. And like right. even this year of like putting together all the classes and studying and talking to you and Guru Chandra about it, it's been like, I didn't realize how much I didn't know about myself, hmm. you know, in, oh my gosh, which was the, I think it was last month for the aura and like the, like being self-contained and I didn't realize how I wasn't self-contained mm -hmm. in so many different areas, you know, so even just like studying it and going through it. So could you please talk a little bit to what yoga numerology is and how we use it? Yeah. So typically numerology is used to tell you about your future. If you have a, you know, it, it kind of, if you should invest in the stock market or if you should be with this partner or not. So yogic numerology is actually about the journey within. Yeah. It's about you getting to know yourself. And the interesting part is that it relates to 10 bodies. Now, typically in the yoga world, we know about seven chakras. Uh -huh. However, when, you, when we moved into this new age with all this... Uh, Technology, IT, AI, all, all this stuff that's hap that we are now that ha we have at our exposure, at our disposal. disposal. <laughs> <laughs> our exposure. Um, we are the ones that needed the upgrade. Yeah. So there's an awareness that we have received, and I believe it's always been with us. It's just we're getting more and more connected to the subtle expression of who we are. Um, there's not just seven chakras. There's also these three energetic bodies. It's like the, the, really the realm of the mysterious. Yeah. It's the realm of the sacred that's being more made more available. So in yogic numerology, through you picking your birthday, picking your parents, it's all, you know, we, we are up. Like when baby comes. When the baby comes down, yeah. it's a very specific time that they're, yes. a specific day that they're born. And they come in with a destiny. So in yoga, in Kundalini Yoga, we believe that your destiny is actually written in this arc line, this sixth body, mm -hmm. from ear earlobe to earlobe. 
it, it radiates out from the third eye. There's about six or you know more rays of light that create this arc line. You see it on the pictures of Jesus. He has the halo. And this is why people go to temples and bow, put their arc line on that which is sacred to them so that you unite that your destiny with the divine. When you learn through yogic numerology, what your gifts are, what your challenges are, what your opportunities are this lifetime, it allows you to be the driver of your bus. It allows you to be your own teacher, to be your own guru. And I believe that in the yoga world, there is a huge shift that's happening now from needing a teacher, from needing a guru that you bow to, to really recognizing that you are that. Yeah and that yogic numerology is a way that you can you can pick the yoga sets that you need to do you can pick the mantras that you can chant there's ways you can reach your energetic body when you learn about these 10 bodies is like which one is is stronger which one is weaker and it, it's just more fun that way that you get to you get to design. You get to design your spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. You don't have or to like read ten thousand books. That and like that, it's not because I feel like when people start on your spiritual journey, it's like, what do I like? Where, yeah, do, I where start? do I start? And I feel like mm -hmm. yoga numerology has always been like a map for me. Right. Right. So like, I have three tens in my numerology. I know. And I have a Look lot how of radiant she <laughs> is. <laughs> I do, and so it. I've been really studying it this year specifically, like going back through and being like, how are these. Like, how am I not understanding this? And I have learned so much more about myself really over the last few months than it's like helped me so much in my relationships and mm -hmm. like noticing. So tens radiant, but we're also all or nothing, mm -hmm. right? We're 110% or we're on the next train out. <laughs> and I realized that in the ways that I communicate, I was really doing that to people mm -hmm. and that if people weren't like, like for me, right? Like I have a podcast, right? Like I love to talk it out. Like if there's something going on between us, we're going to talk it out. We're going to hug it out. We're probably going to cry, but like communication is the way that we heal. And I realized that that's not the way that Everybody. a lot of people heal. <laughs> that's actually really painful for a lot of people. And so I was feeling like, oh, like they don't care about me and blah, blah, blah. And like, it was so you're either going to heal with me this way or we're not going to heal, oh. you know? And so it was very mm. all or nothing. And then I studied some more and sat with it and meditated and I was like, whoa, I am being a little bit of a dick in this situation, like a little <laughs> closed off. And so it's just helped me a lot to think like that I don't have to not just reinvent the wheel, but I don't have to just like fire shots in the dark. Like there's things right. that I'm really good at and then there's things that I really struggle with. Yeah. And owning that and learning about that has been really empowering for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's been a... The reason we wrote these three books is to really just give people more, a deeper and deeper expression and, and connection to this opportunity. And it's, you know, I never could get into it in the beginning because I don't, numbers aren't my thing. I just, you know, I would much rather just go meditate and be in the intuitive realm. And then I realized, wow, it's actually very helpful because yeah. I can hone my intuition in a way that I don't have to think about doing everything. I can just, you know, we're all, we've got five, five numbers, so I can just focus on those five for yeah. now. And then I have two the same ones. I have two sixes. So it makes it even, you know, even less. Perfect. So, but then, you know, so you know that when your soul came in and you pick more, you that more than one number is the same. Have three. You have three that you really came in with a very, you know, intentional mm -hmm. purpose. And, you know, they say Navani came in with a very intentional purpose. She has two fives. Mm. Teach, 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 you know, and she's already like, yeah. yeah, yeah, <laughs> she can speak just fine. Yeah. I, uh, my brother-in-law's girlfriend has three sixes. Whoa. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. She's yeah. got she's got a very serious focus. Yeah. And then then the question is what are you focusing on? Right. You know, mm -hmm. with with if if you have 6 in your numerology, if you're born in June uh or your numbers that you're born on are add up to a 6, that's, you know, what are you focusing on? And our our energy bodies so an event happens in your past it hurts you, right? 
that event is now over. It's not something that's impacting us anymore because it's, it's gone. It's not here now. What's here now is how you interpreted that. Mm -hmm. And if it happened in the second chakra where there's a lot of stuff that happens yeah. to us, um, then that energetic body, I believe, actually sh shifts its shape so that it's no longer in a harmonic with this universe where you know, we can pull anything out of the universe yeah. that we want. So you start attracting more and more of that pain to you because that's now what you're resonating. So when you do this practice and when you have the awareness with yogic numerology to really focus on the, on the numbers where you know you came in to do your work, to be more attentive to, um, and then you see your life shift. I mean, literally, the outside world starts shifting. Some people that used to like you are all of a sudden no longer wanting to be with you, and vice versa. All of a sudden, you have a husband that shows up that's the most beautiful, amazing thing ever. And it's not because the outside. It's because you shifted on yeah. the inside. Did you notice that? Oh, completely. Like, he came after I went through this, like, really painful relationship, and it... Literally, it was, it happened while my parents bought this land in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And I would, we were staying at a friend's house down the road and I would drive here and I would sit on the back deck and sob mm -hmm. and like, or I would go out to, there's this tree out there that I would go out to and like sob. And I just felt like I had to like let everything go. Like I cried probably harder than I've ever cried in just like going through something. And then it was in like, I think being so empty, I was like, mm -hmm. You know, I was like, I don't want any of this anymore. You know, and it, that was like probably the deepest I've gone down in there and like really cleared stuff out. Mm -hmm. And then I went on quite a spiritual journey down in Peru. And then Cody just was like, it's me. <laughs> I want to love you for everything. And like, <laughs> you're perfect and in alignment. And it was like, yeah, no, it was, it was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So it's when we, when we learn the techniques to shift our energetic makeup, yeah. then your life starts giving you that confirmation. Yeah. But Typically, we wait for it the other way around. Well, mm -hmm. if I only have enough money in the bank, then I'll become this person. Yeah. Or if I, if you know, if I could, if my mother could just treat me in a different way, then I could feel happy. Yeah. And in Kundalini Yoga, especially with the guidance of yogic numerology, we learn that that's that's actually backwards. Yeah. And the more effective way of living, the more you know, uh, I mean, the, it's a way quicker way to experience joy in your life. It's way better. Way, way, way much better. So we talked a little bit about the difference between religion and spirituality. And I'd like for you, because Kundalini is a practice, right? The spiritual practice. But you decided to join a religious part of it also. Right. And still practice and wear the turban, took the name, mm -hmm. all the things. So could you explain that to us? All the things, yes. So like I said, in the way beginning, I was very cautious of being Dutch. I was very cautious of religion. That's a Dutch thing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the Dutch people. Well, you got to be. I mean, yeah. we're surrounded by Germany and France. You know, it's just like... Stuff's it's going like, on. <laughs> yeah. So you got to really be cautious. And... Um, but at that time, what I saw in... Okay. So I started doing the Kundalini practice. And it brought me home to myself. And yeah. I recognized that, that I wanted to have a lifestyle that really supported that. I found that in the Sikh path because, as I said, way back then, it was just fun and we were all doing things together. Um, as a Sikh, I uh, have made a commitment to keep my hair long. Mm -hmm. Well, as a yogi, yogis, when you go to India, you see them all piling their big, you know, their dreads on top of their head. So hair, again, is, is thought of as something that helps conduct the energy. It's very much for the radiant body. You know, when you keep your hair, it, it allows you to have more uh, energy from the sun that you pull into your body. And then you can use that energy to uh, uplift your spirit. So 
I didn't become a Sikh. I actually recognized that I'd been living like that already. Yeah. So I thought, oh, okay, well, if this is like a bunch of people doing it, it's got to be more <laughs> fun. Great. Yeah, it's like, oh, wow. <laughs> is there food? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> always the food. Um, so, and it was a lot of chanting, and the, the whole Sikh thing was about, or is about, that consciousness and the divine is expressed through sound. So it's the Shabbat Guru. And then, of course, in Kundalini Yoga, there's a lot of chanting. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of bleed over. Um, that's not a right word, but there's, there's a lot of connection. Similarities. In, in between, similarities between the paths. And this, the Sikh path is a religion. It's called a Dharma, Sikh Dharma. So it's a way of life more than something you do every, you know, every so often. Yeah. And... As a Sikh, I keep my hair. As a Sikh, I promise that I will work for my money. You rarely see Sikh beggars. It's very much of an honor thing to be a contribution rather than take, be a taker. Um, as a Sikh, I... What are some of those things? I wear, you know, the kada. I have some symbols that I keep on me just to help me stay focused. So I've been very mindful that when I teach Kundalini Yoga, I don't, I try not to mix those. So it's mm -hmm. not a message that, pe that people are going to have to even decide, you know, am I now being a Sikh or am I being yeah. a Kundalini Yogi? So we've been very careful in our studio and now with Pure's Potential to not mix that. And that when we teach Kundalini Yoga, it's literally just the practice of the of raising the Kundalini mm -hmm. and of living a, a lifestyle that supports the raising of the Kundalini. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of the you know practices when you go to China for Chinese medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, that all kind of comes from the same roots, mm. you know, from India. Um, living consciously, living in community, living, you know, bowing to the sacred. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it gets very like, well, what? You know? So you do not have to be a Sikh yeah. to practice Kundalini Yoga. And I never felt that. You know? And I think that was really cool coming into it. Like, this is how we've made it like a bigger part of our life. But like, there is a separation because right. I think even with like vinyasa when I started like I started practicing like 10 years ago there was a lot of people who were saying yoga is a church and yoga is a religion and all right. these things and it's you just got to go <laughs> then you know right you got to go and find right. it out but right. um but yeah and your turban yeah so so my turban is not a little different from what mm -hmm. I used to wear. I'm also not just wearing white anymore. I mean, I have a white top on, but... Um, the but you used to just wear exclusively white. Yes. And when you teach, you wear white. Yeah, when I teach. And I've learned, I, I do a lot of women's ceremonies mm -hmm. now, and a lot, of, you know, on the full moon, we all wear white because yeah. that is to honor the energy of the moon. On the, on the dark moon, the no moon, we wear black. Mm -hmm. And so there's technology that comes with colors, and yeah. I've learned, you know, I'm, I'm exploring with that, and I'm enjoying that. And the turban is actually, for me, a yogic tool. Because when you look at the Sikh religion, hardly any of the women wear turbans. Oh. Yeah, so it's, not, it's keeping the hair, that's the commitment I've uh -huh. made. But where, you know, the turban I enjoy because it helps me to focus. And I, I, you know, I don't wear it all the time anymore. But when I go to town and I'm around a lot of people and I don't have my turban on, I definitely feel different when I come home. I have to do a little bit more. Yeah. Like, okay, I got to sit in my hot tub a little longer now. <laughs> Big hot tub family. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so into the hot tub. And... Um, so yeah, I use, and cotton, they say, helps filter out, you know, yeah. denser energy. And so I use it. It's a tool for me. It's mm -hmm. something, it's not a part of my, and, and I actually don't practice the seek path thing the same way I used to. Yeah. I'm, you know, uh, I've, I've realized that a lot of my journey has been to, to move my focus from out there to in here, instead of following what somebody else tells me to do, to really take that guidance. You know, after I do a strong practice in the morning, you know, 
and then sit down and ask myself, you know, is it is it a turban day or is it not a turban day? And then yeah. it's like, wow, I can make those choices. There's no thunderbolt and lightning strikes <laughs> that are going to happen when I don't follow the rules yeah. that, you know, and it's that's been a huge journey, especially as a woman, especially my generation, you know, and so I'm diving in now. You ready? I'm ready. So when I came from Holland, I remember being with my father and stepmother, and I was talking to my stepmother about, you know, her, like, why don't you go, you know, you love cooking. Why don't you start a, a, a little restaurant or help to cook for people or things like that? And my father <laughs> the next day said, you know, I don't think you should be talking to her about things like that. She's here to take care of me, okay? Now, my father is like, you know, he was a very accomplished, very wealthy man, but very much of that mindset is like a woman's role is to support the male. You know, a woman's role is to be there to make sure that his needs are taken care of. Then maybe she can take care of her own needs. And that's what I grew up in. And it wasn't so overt, but it was definitely part of the Dutch culture. And then I came to America and joined this movement, which had a lot now on the other end of it. I recognize had a lot of cultish expression and cultish behaviors woven into it that made it all very confusing, um, like gaslighting and just very confusing. But I joined a, let's say, the cult of 3HO, and it was very much in alignment with that. The teacher, Yogi Bhajan, was there as the one who knew what needed to happen. He would even say, you know, the next five years, there's going to be a lot of this kind of energy. Therefore, we should all prepare in this way. And that felt very familiar and very comfortable for me. It's like I liked having a male who I respected tell me what to do. Yeah. I was very, that was comfortable. Um, the problem was that when I started doing this practice, um, you know, you wake up. And I started recognizing the, and this was after a while. I mean, uh, we're talking years. <laughs> so, um, but like, I started. Like how long? Like a decade? Yeah. Yeah. Like, or you were, two. Right. Okay. Okay. So yes. like, let's say two decades. So now it's like a I'm couple doing years. It. This was like. Yeah. This was a, this, yeah. yeah. Like your kids were raised there yes. or born there. Oh, and my kids loved it there. And yeah. I loved it. We had a community. My kids were running around. We had tons of people we hung out with. Right. It was like a big, happy family. And then, then what started happening is that I noticed that any time I would have a different opinion from Yogi Bhajan, and my husband and I were in the inner circle. I remember one time I told Yogi Bhajan that I was going to go, my husband and I were going to go to a Harville Hendricks marriage thing, a weekend in San Francisco. And he said, ah, oh, you shouldn't go. And he just it was really intense on me. And I'm just kind of like looking at this. He said, all you need to do is just listen to what I tell you and then everything will be fine. Yeah. Which I immediately went, being the Dutch person I am, now I'm definitely going to the Harville <laughs> Hendrix weekend because I want to know what this is all about. Right. What are you trying to hide from me? Right? It's like, what is happening here? So we went and then... But from that moment on, you know, when a mirror cracks, you kind of start going, huh, I wonder where yeah. else this shows up. So Yogi Bhajan had a great capacity to have other people pay for him to do things or use other people's money. That was one of his teachings, OPM, OPI, other people's intelligence, other people's money or resources. Mm. And at one point, I looked at our credit card because I had children by now, so I wasn't quite involved with all that. And we had substantial debt. Yeah. Like, I'm talking about substantial debt. And I looked at my husband like, where did this come from? What is this? And we went on a Zen diet, spending no more money. It had all come from my husband being Yogi Bhajan's driver and spending outrageous amounts of money, taking all the secretaries and all the people out and until you said to 
to Yogi Bhajan, no more, we're done with this, he would just use everything. Yeah. So I started, you know, we started kind of seeing the, the, the man rather than having, you know, having had this person on a pedestal, he couldn't do anything wrong, yeah. he was right about everything. I started noticing that, yeah, no, this is actually a dude trying to figure things out just like me, yeah. which is how it should be. And on the one hand, taking somebody off a pedestal was terrifying because that really put the onus on me. And in another way, it was liberating, liberating from all the conditioning that I had had as a woman, that I had had as a student. Um, the Yogi Bhajan would always say, I, you know, you are all here to be 10 times greater than me. Well, any time any of the students became popular, the community instigated by him would go on a witch hunt after that person to somehow cut them down or find fault or to shun them or so, and it got really it got very very unpleasant and i remember sitting around you know with yogi bhajan at one point and all the women are sitting there and we're all on the floor he's of course on the couch and he was just railing on this one person who wasn't there and then he looked at me because he probably could see my my yeah. you know me going what is going on yeah. here? And he said, so what do you think? And I just stood up. I said, this person isn't even here, this person you're talking about. And this is completely not about anything that I'm interested in doing to someone else. Yeah. Just kind of, you know, digging a grave for them. And, and then he sent the people after me. You know, I wasn't, I was making $1,000 a month and working like you know, you know me, I was just working nonstop. I was taking care of everything in the ashram and, you know, we were really helping grow the ashram, building buildings and... And I was going to say that because your inner circle, you mentioned that, but Guru Chandra was his personal chiropractor. Yes, he was there every single night. Every day. Every day. With him all every the single time. No, not all the time. He was or, there every night. Yes. He was there every night. Yes. And then you two helped to build that yes. huge center. In Española, yeah. We helped yeah. build the, the the temple and the you know the different spaces, yeah. the, the children's places areas. So we were instrumental there, and we loved it. Right. I mean, absolutely loved it. It was an amazing time. It was like a dream come true. Yeah. You know, living in this utopia that. And then and then the the shadow part came up, and instead of actually dealing with it and actually having the community sit together and have the heart to heart conversations that were very difficult, what happened was a witch hunt you know that Grichander and I became the target because we uh, had a different way of interpreting what Yogi Bhajan's wishes were when he died, and uh, the community didn't support that we had a you know, a public hearing with everybody and apologize for any any pain that we had caused and that didn't do anything. Nobody, you know, nothing really changed. But it it became painfully obvious that the community had gotten in a pattern, a, a cult pattern, I hate to say, yeah. of, you know, you're either in or out. There is no communication about anything that's wrong here because there's nothing wrong here. We're in utopia. We're in a utopia. And, you know, Emma, I was walking in Santa Fe once with my dog and people were saying hi to me. They didn't even know me. And in my mind, I'm thinking, wow, people are really nice. The next thought I had is, wow, why did I think they weren't? Oh. Because in the ashram, yeah. we were the chosen ones. Huh. We were the ones, you know, and the, the wider your turban and the, the more beautiful your outfits, the more, you know, the bigger your Mercedes, the bigger your jewels, that's how you were successful. And I realized that the success that I wanted my whole life was just to be happy, to have, yeah. to have authentic connections with other people, which the yoga gave me. Right. And the ashrams had given me up to a certain point. And when Yogi Bhajan started becoming sick, he couldn't hold the psyche of the... And I literally thought, experienced, that he could 
He was a shaman. He, yeah. was a, he was a medicine man. He could hold the psyche. I mean, for 20 years till after his death, he was able to hold the illusion of who he was yeah. until it cracked. And it cracked because all the women spoke up. Yeah. But they didn't do that while they were in there. If they could have done that when the abuse was happening to these women, but he had such a hold on people that you just could not speak against him yeah. or it. And to this day, I cannot show up in the Española community, in the ashram that we helped build. It's not a, about love and peace to this day. Yeah. They, they, they would like to say that it is, but I could not go there. I, I mean, we, that was part of our teacher training and we went Yeah. and it, and this is before everything came out, like before the real crack happened. Right. Um, and it did seem like people were kind of pissed that you were there, mm -hmm. you know, or just like, right. like you're not all that anymore. Right. Kind of like, yeah. like this isn't where you're supposed to be. Right. And it was, it was weird. Cause on one hand, like, I think that if I I think I probably would have jumped right in and like lived in an ashram. And I think like everything that you're saying is like so beautiful in the communal living. And then like to have that ruptured. Oh, it was. So for me, you know, Yogi Bhajan died and that was incredibly painful. The reason I could have more children is because he helped me. He helped me through that pain. Yeah. He, he, told me everything would be fine and I believed him and thank God I did. <laughs> and also like gave you the technology to yes. train your nervous system yes. and let go of all this stuff. So the process of keeping that baby and letting the bathwater go has been extremely difficult because my initial tendency when everything came out and I told the divine, I said, if this woman, and I won't mention her name, if this woman comes out and says that this is what happened to her, then I'll know it's true. And I kid you not, the next morning she came out and said, this, this also happened to me. This is after the book that Prem Kakar wrote came out. The women actually, some of the women came together and started speaking. And I knew as much as I know that the sun's going to rise tomorrow morning, that they were speaking truth because I had had several instances with him that were inappropriate. And I won't go into the details, but I had to kind of remove myself because it was not appropriate. I didn't feel safe. I didn't feel comfortable in what was going down. And it was directly at me. Yeah. So, um, for me as a woman, and I noticed that the, the people that are the deniers that say he did nothing wrong and all those women are liars, they're, they're usually men. Yeah. And I asked a psychologist, because I went to a to therapist for like 10 years to help process all this and did a whole lot of meditation and yoga. But I asked this therapist, do women lie about this kind of abuse? And he said, Hardly ever. Yeah. And one of my very close girlfriends in the ashram that since the whole breakdown I've lost touch with was his personal security guard. And she actually investigated all these women before it all came out. And she had to, what I heard is came to the decision that all their stories corroborated. They all said the same thing that the women shaved, that got shaved down here, that, you know, the, the, the abuse was in a certain way. And it just, it all lined up. And I have personal friends and close women that were in that inner, inner circle. Now, Gretchen and I were in like the next ring out, thank God. We yeah. never saw this. If we had seen any of it, we would have left. And we didn't. Yeah. Um, maybe we didn't want to, but I never actually saw it. Um, these friends that I have that are, were in his innermost circle that were abused by him tell the same story. And when you sit with a woman and you have her tell you that pain and, um, there's just no way you can deny it. Yeah. And it, it pains me to see a community that had such a beautiful vision about, you know, being healthy, happy, holy, being a contribution to the world, to have that now be about trying to prove the innocence 
of a man who said we weren't here, that he was a postman. He was here to deliver the mail. Mm -hmm. He, at the end of his life, he was telling people, when you start hearing stories about me, which you might, don't, you know, don't let that stop you from this practice. I mean, he, he knew this was going to come out. You can't have this happen and not have it come out. It took 20 years, but it came out. And, you know, my very wise son looked at me right in the beginning and he said, Mama, this is the best thing that could have happened for Kundalini Yoga because it was always this cultish, weird energy around Yogi Bhajan. You guys said he wasn't your teacher and all that, but he really was. And he, you know, you said these things, but it wasn't really the case. And now it's just clear. Yeah. It's not about him. And it never was about him. It was about me and my journey. So I've worked very hard at keeping the things that are important. And even in the Sikh religion, you know, when you talk to other Sikhs that are born into it in, in, in India, they look at us saying, you know, what are you guys doing? This has nothing to do with our religion. Yeah. So it's like it became so enmeshed and so much his personal way that he wanted to take it forward. And I believe in the beginning, he was definitely doing it for all the right reasons. Yeah. He wanted to bring consciousness. He was, you know, he had a vision that he was supposed to share all this technology and did and has a, did an incredible job. And then I believe what started happening is that the power of what we gave him, I mean, we put him on that pedestal. Yeah. You know, we all let him teach us in ladies camp. He was the dude telling us how to be women. And now I look at that going, how did that work? <laughs> yeah. He's telling us how I'm supposed to be a woman. You know, yeah. that's, it's just, but it was me that allowed that to happen for me. And I learned a lot. Yeah. And, you know, those teachings about women, I am not following that per se. I'm doing the teachings that he gave us about Kundalini Yoga. He had, a, you know, attachment parenting. He was totally supportive of that. Uh, you know, co-sleeping with your child, keeping him on you, breastfeeding, living a natural lifestyle, eating healthy vegetarian food. There's so much that, that I'm still doing. Yeah. But the teachings about how to be a woman, no. Yeah. You know, uh, the teachings about how to have a relationship with a male, no. Yeah. You know, he had a horrible marriage. Yeah. He had a horrible marriage. His children, you know, didn't even want to talk to him. Because what I found in my life that really works for me in relationships is the Imago, <laughs> Imago horrible. therapy. I know. Horrible. Cody and I do it too. <laughs> <laughs> so it, the Imago process to really learn how to have a, you know, a conversation together that yeah. you can be respectful. And that was never something that was really taught in yeah. the ashram. That was never something, you know, the guys really had a di very different place. And there's still, you know, we called them the, the good old boys club, you know, was a, this little pack of men that would always like do things together and talk yeah. down at women. And, and, you know, that was a generation that was, that was important for them to feel like that. But I just feel like life has moved on and, you know, especially as yogis, you know, we're the ones that need to keep changing as the times change and, and right. keep keep up with the times. And I think this time is just we're required to be in authentic relationship with each other. Yeah. So. So to my knowledge, there were at least 30 to 50 women that were abused, sexually, abused. sexually abused by him. Mm -hmm. um, he, he started off with Premka, which was his secretary general. He always she's gave the one all who these, wrote the book. She's the one who wrote the book. Now, the interesting thing is she tried, to, she tried to expose this while he was still alive. And because of the power that he had and the people that he knew, he squashed it. He just basically said he was going to take her to court and bury her. And she didn't have the wherewithal. She didn't have the, the, the money, the right. all, uh, whatever, to stand up to that. And that was from anger. Now, when she wrote this book, it's a love book. Right. The, the White Bird in the Golden Cage or something like that by Premka or Pamela Dyson, I think her name is now. Um, when she wrote it as a love story, it, it was true. I mean, people heard it and it, it, she had no idea that it would start off this avalanche of 
revelations and and all of a sudden you know the the veneer being pulled off and like you know this is the actual this is actually what happened right this is the under underbelly of the beast this is the shadow that was there and again for me it's important to keep saying i think it's important that we saw the dark side but there was also the light side yeah and and the dark side if we use it correctly, if we allow that to inform us, to never allow that to happen again, men should never have that kind of power. Yeah. Women should never be subservient to, to a masculine voice, ever, for any reason. We should be, you know, in my concept, yoga is when you bring the sun and the moon, the male and the female, and you integrate them. It's not one obliterates the other one. Right or one is more powerful than the other one. It's a literally, it's a coming together. And then in the coming together, you create something new. A little Navani. <laughs> right, but like, and even like with that, it's like, I always think about that because I feel like my dad and I like have so many similar characteristics and like sometimes our masculine and our feminine like flare up in different ways, but like I have the masculine and the feminine within me. And just because my feminine presents stronger and like my soul decided to do that, like, I just think it's it's infuriating that because I chose to have a female experience in this way, you know, that I am somehow lesser or right. less worthy or, you know, in any single way. And I think, you know, there's this crazy rise of energy right now about the divine feminine saying enough. Yeah. You know, there was a doctor in Santa Fe, Tre Trevor Hawkins, I think, who... I interviewed him once about the AIDS crisis that was happening in Africa when all America was going, oh, well, that's so far away. Yeah. We don't have to think about that. You know, that's right. not our country. And he was the one saying, hey, this is going to be all over the world. We got to deal with this now. Yeah. So I said, what do you think is the most powerful thing that we can do to stop this crisis? And I'm thinking he's going to ask for like $5 million. Yeah. You know what he said? When women own their power this crisis will be over. And that was way back when, and I just kind of went, bing, it's you know, yes. like, whoa. When women own their power, and the Dalai Lama has said it, you know, that, that, that the world will heal when women can stand in their power. Now, typically when women get in their power, we start comparing and competing with each other. and We do it to, against other women. Yeah, against yeah. other women. And I, you know, even in the political scene in America right now, just the possibility of what could happen is like, wow, you know, to really be as a woman in an equal playing field with the masculine in a way, and that we're still women, because yeah. I bring something very different to the table uh -huh. being a woman. A man cannot have a child. You know, it's not possible. And there's a sensitivity that I have as a mother that is different from a male. And I don't think, you know, we're not supposed to be the same thing. We're yeah. supposed to be authentically ourselves and then create from those places. So, you know, in the whole Yogi Bhajan revelation process, there was an incredible opportunity. There is an opportunity just to take back my power that I had given away. I had given it away to someone else. He never forced me to. You know, this was my choice, and that was the whole environment was kind of set up for that. And, you know, the, the cultish part of the whole experience was that we couldn't bring up dissent. We couldn't bring up, like, hey, can we do this in a different way? Hey, we're not so into all this political thing that you're doing and, yeah. you know, all that stuff. And, and there, was, there was no room for that. There was no room for the teachers to really become amazing yoga teachers and not have him be somehow feeling like you weren't doing it the way that he wanted you to do it. So in that way, and you know, I have a deep prayer that the ashram can heal and that they can, you know, just own their power in a way that it's authentic and it's not because because the whole thing between the you know the believers and the non-believers we call them yeah. now 
is that the people that believe Yogi Bhajan did nothing wrong and that never happened are on a mission now about him, protecting him. And to me, the mission was never that. Right. You know, he, he told all of us, I'm the postman. I'm just delivering the mail. It's not about me. Don't put me on a pedestal. He had us go, Gurchandra and I, he had us go to Taos once a week. We had to drive all the way up there. It's a long way up yes. there. <laughs> and we had to chant in the Hanuman temple. And Yogi Bhajan told us to go do that because they were trying to make it the Neem Karoli Baba Ashram. Mm -hmm. And he says, you can't do it. It was never about Neem Karoli Baba. It was about his guru, which is Hanuman. Mm -hmm. So it needs to stay the Hanuman Ashram. That needs to be the name, which it still is today. But he gave, you know, there, there were messages in there that were beautiful and correct and uplifting. Yeah. And yet when it really came down to it, not so much, Didn't really not allowed. It. No. Yeah, yeah I'm going to make my own rules. Yeah. <laughs> Just going to do my own thing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Painful. Very painful. Mm. Very painful. Yeah. And I mean, it seems like there is still like the believers and the non-believers. Yes. You know, and so... And I guess I'd also just like to point out, like, this isn't the first yoga practice for something like this to happen. Oh, God, it's happened. It's a lot, you yeah. know? And yeah. it is really sad and painful, but, like, the practice of yoga is so pure and authentic, and people need it. Yeah. You know, and that practice, and people need those practices, and I think that's why you know, things like this can kind of happen is because you're in that vulnerable state of looking for answers yeah. and someone's like, oh my God, try this, try this. And then all of a sudden it's like, tell me what to do, yeah. you know? And there's this, and like, I totally see how that happens. Um, but I think it's really, I think it's like even in Bikram, right? Like they've been able to separate the right. practice from the teacher, from the teacher, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that for Kundalini being so kind of ripe in this still. Yeah. Like, I think we're still in the... Yeah, trying to figure out. a little bit. Right. <laughs> so, so what do you see as the future of Kundalini then? And I guess not just as the practice, but like the organizational bodies of it. Do we need a woman in church? <laughs> do I even need to mm -hmm. answer that? <laughs> um, I believe... What I see in the world is that the f energetic frequency that is now available mm -hmm. for whatever the planets are doing or what, whatever is doing it is happening. It's happening. You know, there's a, there's a, the structures that we currently have can no longer support the frequency of what's here. Yeah. You can see it in our banking system, in our politics, in our religions, mm -hmm. in our, you know, the Espanol ashram. <laughs> Very much. So until people and women included, especially, can align themselves with the new frequency, with the new opportunity, with the new reality of what we're heading towards and what we're into already, that those structures that cannot uphold that will crumble. Yeah. And I believe that when you're not aligning with truth, with Dharma, then there will be crumbling. And what I'm seeing in the Kundalini organization right now is that there's not an authentic alignment with truth. And that the, there was a takeover of the KRI, the, the organization that holds the Kundalini teachings. And there was a hostile takeover. And the people that took it over want to impress upon everyone that Yogi Bhajan is innocent, that he is the, the beautiful, in, incredible teacher, and it is about him. And, and those of us that, you know, I was involved with the duplicitous organization. If I would have found out, I would have left. I didn't find out. And I won't align myself anymore with a, an organization such as KRI, Kundalini Research Institute, that has two teacher training books. One that's exactly the same, the way that it's always been, with Yogi Bhajan's quotes and all that. And then one for people that do believe that he... Believers and non-believers. Exactly. So even in the way that Kundalini Yoga is yeah. going forward, 
by the KRI Institute is duplicitous. Yeah. It, it, it allows you to choose between the two. And if, to me, if, you know, if, 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 if this journey of, of Kundalini Yoga is about truth and authenticity, then how can I be part of an organization that doesn't practice that? Yeah. So a lot of the senior teachers, such as myself and my husband, have had to make the very difficult choice of saying, you know, then I'll have to do my own thing. Yeah. You know, cause, cause, and my thing is aligned with all these other senior teachers that are now doing their own thing. And perhaps that's always what it was meant to be. Yeah. You know, not some central place holding it all. And, and really, if it is about empowerment and authenticity, then every single person can walk it in the way they need to walk it. You know, there's just a few rules, like you can't screw your t students. Yeah, well, we blew that one, didn't we? I feel like that, like... <laughs> God. So after that one, after that got revealed, it's like, whoa, 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 here. Yeah, right? <laughs> come on, come on, come on. <laughs> okay, so we're not screwing students. That's yeah, good. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's really heavy, and I really appreciate you sharing all this, you know, and even wanting to speak about it, because I think... There's a lot of questions still about mm -hmm. the organization. And I think even, honestly, even when you were kind of, even when you've said it was very culty, like to me, that was, I feel like such a exhale for me mm -hmm. of, okay, like we can, we can talk about these things that right. were a little bit weird now, you know, and like there were still so many wonderful and beautiful things, but there were some really hard parts right. that were not very digestible that seemed a little bit weird. Like, why did he have to have eight Rolls Royces? You know, and like, mm -hmm. why, like, why was there like so much material right. focus, you know? And so now I feel like that, like you said, the veil has just been pulled back. And so like the time is now to ask questions. Yeah. And really what is it, you know, what are you engaging with it for? Right. And it's not so much about what somebody else, how somebody else says you should be doing it. It's really like, what can you take from this that works for you? Right. And it's so empowering that way. Mm -hmm. It's so much more fun that way. It's like, you know, because when, as a teacher, if you actually think that you can tell someone else what they should be doing, what an incredible, difficult thing that is. Yeah. You know, then you start carrying people on your back. And it's like, no, let me give you the tools. Let me give you the numerology. Let me give you the yoga sets. Now you go figure it out. Mm -hmm. We have three books that we wrote. Okay, you go figure out the sets for the bodies that you want to work on. Yeah. You do the mantras. You know, they're all over YouTube. And yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you can find everything everywhere. Yeah. So, you know... Well, so I guess even, I mean, little Navani has since gone to sleep now. <laughs> we hope. We're just rambling on here. But I guess, you know, when you think about kind of these generational patterns and shifting it, like what is, when you think about the world that Navani is going to grow up in, you know, are there any key points that you really want to make sure you instill or that you're kind of teaching and empowering other women? I keep looking over there because that's where she laid. <laughs> um, inclusivity, you know, that, there, that our journey really is about creating oneness, about, and not just creating, but experiencing the oneness that we share to take care of the earth. You know, I really hope we don't leave our next generation with this incredible debt this, this mountain of debt that we've created in the United States that we can learn to be fiscally responsible to and, and, and be as responsible, you know, stewards of the earth, that uh, women can be honored for who they are, that people can be honored for loving others the way that they need to love others, that there's different ways we deal with people that are poor or that are mentally challenged and that they don't end up on the streets and then nobody knows what to do with them. You know, that, there's, that we can start teaching children when they're born that they're unique and that they're beautiful and that they're powerful and that they are loved mm -hmm. and that they get an education. Everybody, all children get education that, you know, and I'm, I hope we can leave a world like that for my granddaughter where women are honored and, 
and different and differences are honored. Yeah. You know, that we actually are stronger when we come together because of our differences. And, mm-hmm. um, but man, we've got, we've got some work to do. We've got some work to do. Mm-hmm. We've got a lot of work to do. And I believe in my heart that practicing a practice such as Kundalini Yoga will bring people to that authenticity that yeah. they, they, you, because once you have a child you can't you know children and dogs you can't hide from <laughs> they know <laughs> and cats too uh-huh. maybe your cats maybe too. um you know they know the truth they know what aligns with universal law yeah and and then we uh, our lifestyle has been removing people has removed people from that knowing and now we're just you know on our on our screens and trying to ask google for everything when you know we we have that within mm-hmm. us we have that con- capacity to connect with everything mm-hmm. yogis call that the akashic records you know there's a I mean, you think Google is a lot. You know, these are Akashic records is where you download your, all your learning at your time of death. And this has been happening forever. Yeah. And there is a, a place as yogis that we can get to to get that inf- access to that kind of information. You know, makes Google look like kindergarten. I'm just saying. Try our technology. <laughs> That's right. Well, as we begin to wrap up, Kieran. Um, before tomorrow morning. <laughs> I have two more questions. Yeah, before you just sleep over. I have two more questions for you. The first is, um, you know, our podcast is called Hidden Pearls. And so hidden pearls are, you know, rays of light or things that are inspiring us or just like lessons that we're learning. So is there a hidden pearl in your life that has been really prevalent lately? You can say Navani. <laughs> <laughs> um, a hidden pearl. Just this the whole thing I've been talking about that our that for for me to be cognizant of my reactions to life and instead of pointing my finger out there and trying to fix this to really go within myself and and observe to go within myself to observe that trigger for lack of better better word and to take that back into my heart where the integration happens and to keep deepening into my own experience and my own truth and to not have it so much be about out there because it's within me that the energetic frequency can be altered and then my outside will shift. And you know, this, this, that, that once that happens through the heart, I have access to an unlimited amount of possibilities. And I literally, you know, get to go to like the candy store and just, just pick <laughs> something new, yeah. you know? And it's so refreshing to not live my past and it's so overwhelmingly humbling to recognize how much my past has dictated my life you know and to just like just to keep saying okay you know got to do it again you know got to try it again so yeah my pearl is just it's never done just keep bowing to something greater than you and a greater possibility about who you are and trust the process. Don't get all heady about it. You yeah. know, really do the practice to stay embodied, to stay present, to stay in this moment. Yeah, I love that. Okay, well, anything else that you want to share as we wrap up? <laughs> I love you. I love you. That was so great. And I guess I just like even through all like the confusing and painful and like hard stuff, it's like there's still the central pocket of what we love and the practice that we love so much is love. Right. You know, and I just think that now as much as any other time, tuning into that of like strengthening your nervous system, learning how to communicate, learning what our triggers are, right. like that is the greatest form of love. And I just, I hope that if there's anybody watching who might need that, right. that you know that there are different ways to do that and we have the technology. Right. So Kieran, thanks for 
thanks for being on my podcast. I love Thank you. you for having me. I love you. And we'll fun. conclude all the links. You can find it in the show notes. And we'll see you next time. Namaste. Sign down. <laughs>